San Angelo, Texas. Uh, hello, my friends, and welcome to Reflections Upon the Precious Book Divine. My name is Rick Pope Joy, and I have the distinct privilege and uh, uh, the wonderful pleasure of serving as your host today. Hopefully, you're having a uh, wonderful day today, and uh, you are uh, ready, uh, poised, as we would say, and prepared to meditate, to uh, reflect upon the precious book divine. We uh, make this statement every now and then and uh, feel like we need to explain just a couple of things to our listeners. Number one, this is radio worth listening to. If you're listening to us uh, via uh, uh, WJHF 106.9 FM in the Florence, Alabama area. And uh, so we certainly uh, want you to tune in uh, there. And we're grateful if you are, uh, if you're listening to us via TGRN, that is the gospel radio network dot org. Then uh, again, this is radio worth listening to, but it is worth not worth listening to because of your host. It is worth listening to because we are reflecting upon the precious book divine. If you're watching uh, us through Facebook Live, we're glad to have you today, and we're certainly pleased uh, that you can be with us for this fine uh, day. Uh, Let's see here. What do we have on the agenda for today? Today, we are going to be talking about, uh, uh, well, we're going to be continuing our series on uh, the human psyche. And in fact, we are focusing our attention, I guess you would say, as a subcategory to that. We are focusing our attention upon the Beatitudes. And today, we have arrived at Blessed Are the Meek. You know, the, the Beatitudes uh, serve as the heart of the human psyche. Jesus is uh, uh, enticing uh, humanity to uh, uh, his kingdom and how important uh, that is in uh, the introduction to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. This is why you want to be a uh, member of that kingdom and uh, why you want to submit to him as uh, a king. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords, but there are great benefits and great blessings that are attached to that. And so we're certainly grateful that you have joined us uh, here on Reflections Upon the Precious Book Divine. Uh, let's see, I know that we'll have our Bible students uh, joining us. Some I see already uh, are in the process of joining us today while we introduce our uh, program and as we give some uh, announcements along the way. We try to be as concise as we possibly can with regards to this, but uh, I do want to remind you that if you're ever in the Nesbitt, Mississippi area, that you're welcome to come and join us at the Nesbitt Church of Christ. In fact, we would consider you an honored guest. We meet every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for our Bible study. 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. for our opportunities of worship, and we meet every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. And again, we would love to have you come and join us uh, for those times of worship and Bible study. Great, uh, A great uh, edification when the saints are able to assemble themselves uh, together. Well, I see here the phone number today is 405-428-2440. Again, that is 405-428-2440. Even though we do not uh, stress this, uh, this is a daily, uh, a weekday, Monday through Friday, a daily uh, live call-in program. And you are welcome either to join us in the chat windows uh, at TGRN or on Facebook Live, or you are welcome to join us uh, via uh, phone. Uh, your comments, your questions are certainly always uh, um, um, uh, enjoyed, and we appreciate uh, all that do. And uh, I know that we always have a great uh, 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 Bible students that join us in the chat window, and they have some great comments behind the scenes. So you can join us at either one of those those items. I see that uh, Sister Higgins from uh, South Texas has joined us and others will be uh, chiming in here pretty soon. Let's see, what else do we have uh, 
Oh, I did want to, uh, let me grab this over here. I put this over here out of the way and I wasn't intending to, uh, but I uh, want to uh, certainly start announcing uh, uh, now on a more regular basis, the uh, 38th annual Midwest Lectures uh, will be going on September the 20th through the 24th. And so that's just about one month away. Uh, and that is uh, in the Kansas City area. Uh, the uh, 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 39th Street Church of Christ, where Brother Jack Williams preaches, uh, is uh, the one, uh, uh, the congregation that hosts this every year. And uh, we are uh, pleased to uh, uh, be going and uh, serving as a part of that. This year, the uh, theme is Great Bible Questions. Great Bible Questions. And so, uh, we hope that uh, you will be able to join us. Along the way, I'll try to give you a little bit more information in regards to that. But again, that is uh, Great Bible Questions, 38th Annual Midwest Lecture, September the 20th through the 24th uh, in the Kansas City area. And so uh, please come and join us uh, for that. Well, let's see here. Uh, I think that's all that I have on uh uh, the announcement side. So uh, we're about to begin uh, uh, our Bible study, but uh, uh, before we do, we have a word of prayer and a song that awaits, and then we will begin with our Bible study. Shall we pray? Our most righteous and loving Heavenly Father, as we come before thee at this time, we do recognize thee as a magnificent uh, God, and uh, that uh, we uh, stand in awe of uh, thy majestic character and nature. Uh, we realize that uh, thou art a God above all gods and the only God uh, that exists, and we appreciate our Heavenly Father, all of the great care uh, that you have demonstrated to us, not only in thy uh, wonderful providential uh, creation and allowing uh, this earth to generate seed after its own kind, and, uh, but especially our Heavenly Father for the opportunity that we have to be thy children, uh, to be uh, in a saved condition after being lost, after being uh, so far removed and headed toward a devil's damnation. We realize, our Heavenly Father, that you have so blessed us with thy son, Jesus Christ, that you would allow us this opportunity at this time to be able to thank thee uh, for that great gift. We thank thee, our Heavenly Father, for all of the wonderful gifts, uh, one of them that we take part in uh, almost on a daily basis, if not a daily basis, and that is the opportunity to uh, uh, take part of uh, this uh, uh, internet. We know that there are bad things that occur in life, whenever there is a gift that you have allowed men to have, there is always a disturbance of that gift and a distortion of that gift by the devil himself. And so we know of the wickedness that lies in our world today, but may we uh, do our best uh, to promote goodness in this world and to promote thy gospel throughout the world as we do here. Uh, on uh, reflections as we do on uh, the internet, and may we uh, do that uh, to the uh, best of our abilities. Our Heavenly Father, we're mindful of the New Testament church and the fact that uh, it oftentimes undergoes assaults from those without and those within. We pray, our Heavenly Father, that you would help us to have uh, and bless us with the uh, moral fortitude and the resolve uh, to carry out those wonderful blessings and uh, those commandments that you have given us. We live in a world that uh, is uh, disturbed by many things. Our Heavenly Father, we realize that we have an election that is coming up here in America and uh, uh, that sides will be chosen, that uh, 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 divisions will be made, and we pray, our Heavenly Father, that uh, that choice that will uh, both allow the gospel to go forth uh, free and uh, will allow us an opportunity to live in peace uh, and uh, to will be the manner in which uh, we have chosen. Uh, we are thankful, our Heavenly Father, for uh, 
uh, all of our uh, leaders that uh, uh, promote righteousness and goodness, and we ask our Heavenly Father that you would continue to bless them. Defeat us all when we are contrary, living contrary to thy will. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, so we're about to uh, head to our song. I see that uh, Sister Wilson has joined us. Good morning and glad to have you uh, with us. So let's go ahead and get started with uh, Walking on Heaven's Road. Who's that walking down the road, carrying such a heavy load? Sinner, lay your burden down, you're walking on Heaven's Road, and when you're Walking on heaven's road, I gotta lay down my heavy load. Jesus said he'd walk along with me. Praise God, glory, hallelujah. I'm singing all the way. I got sunshine in every day. Won't you come along and join me on that heaven's road? Ain't no people crying there. Ain't no sadness anywhere. Ain't no need to shed a tear. You're walking on heaven's road. And when you're walking on heaven's road, I got to lay down my heavy load. Jesus said he walked along with me. Praise God, glory, hallelujah. I'm singing all the way. I got sunshine in every day. Won't you come along and join me on that heaven's road? Young folks walking hand in hand and singing with the angel band. Old folks ain't so tired and warm, they're walking on heaven's road. And when you're walking on heaven's road, I gotta lay down my heavy load. Jesus said he'd walk along with me, praise God, glory, hallelujah. I'm singing all the way, I got sunshine in every day. Won't you come along and join me on that heaven's road? Won't you come along and join me on that heaven's road? All right, my friends, uh, it's so good to be uh, with you today, and uh, we just appreciate and enjoy uh, the ability to uh, take in that particular song. I see that while we were in song, uh, that uh, Brother Furness uh, from uh, Central Oklahoma has joined us, and uh, Brother Javon Jesse from uh, Hyderabad, India, has joined us. Uh, I'm glad that you were able to find it, and... Uh, uh, I know that sometimes it's a little bit difficult. Uh, there's Sister Woodall. Uh, I saw a few hearts going up and thought uh, you may be already in here, uh, but uh, no doubt uh, uh, we will uh, uh, we will uh, uh, we will progress on uh, with our study for today. And our study for today is a very simple yet profound statement in the Bible, as we will take note of in every one of these Beatitudes, it seems as if uh, these, these simple, brief statements of Jesus contain such an explosive uh, idea behind them, and uh, words and phrases sometimes are spoken of as being pregnant. Uh, that is, this word or this phrase may be with child. It's going to, it's going to uh, give birth to many concepts, is the ideal. And uh, the words and the phrases of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, but in particular uh, with the Beatitudes, listen, they are not just pregnant uh, with concepts. Uh, these are... Uh, these are phrases that, uh, well, uh, can I say that uh, uh, triplets and uh, quadruplets are going to be uh, born out of these words. And I think we've already been able to see just a little bit of that in regards to uh, the first couple of uh, Bible, um, uh, Bible blessings here, right? So we go back. 
uh, to Matthew chapter 5, and uh, we're in the process of uh, the beginning elements of the Sermon on the Mount. And as I have mentioned, uh, I have, uh, <laughs> that's right, Sister Woodall, I had forgotten about that, uh, about those twins. Uh, uh, the Certainly the words of Jesus uh, uh, are enough in regards to that. So, uh, but you have enticements, uh, you have expectations of uh, the, the, the life that, that we ought to live in regards uh, to that. And so uh, uh, then you come down to the high point. And I believe it was Brother Javon who made reference in the chat window a couple of days ago uh, to chapter 7 and verse number 12, which seems to be the pinnacle of the entirety of the sermon. We might say the thesis of his sermon, the proposition, is therefore all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and uh, the prophets. And then Jesus makes those concluding uh, statements uh, from uh, verses 13 through the following or the rest of the chapter there. But that seems to be the idea of the text that we are considering. And uh, so when you come to Matthew chapter 5, you have those enticements to seek the kingdom of God. And here, here is the enticement that we have for us today. Bless, blessed are the meek. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. I can't think of a uh, uh, more uh, misunderstood Bible verse than the one that we are considering today. Not just from uh, the aspect of the word meek or meekness, but also the blessing itself of they shall inherit uh, the earth. And uh, so both of those seem to be misunderstood in uh, today's society. So we do want to ask ourselves several questions as we began to think about this concept. We want to know what meekness is, of course. We want to know who these people are. Uh, if we want to be blessed, then we're going to have to be them. So we want to know who they are. We want to know what kind of characteristic meekness really is. And then we, we want to understand this blessing. What does it mean to inherit the earth? And then we do want to make some uh, uh, concepts, uh, some applications, uh, for us today in regards to that. But you know, when you consider meekness, meekness, as Sister Woodall makes reference to, is often conceived as weakness or somebody being cowardly. Uh, we often think, uh, I, I can think of that song by uh, a famous country singer on the coward of the county, and uh, that uh, uh, that that was a a, a means of meekness. Uh, uh, well, I'm not so sure that that was uh, the the concept, but there is a sense in which, if you study that song, the word meekness might be included. He was certainly not weak. He was certainly not cowardly. He had made a decision. Uh, not to engage in certain behavior because that behavior took his father to the penitentiary where he died and he did not want to be, his father did not want. And so you have, and Sister Woodall makes reference to this, you have power under control. So we're certainly not talking about uh, the concept of weakness. Weakness is not power but it is power under control. I have the power to engage in this activity, but I choose, I'm making a choice not to engage in that. Meekness toward God, my friends, is that disposition of our spirit in which we accept his dealings with us as good and therefore without disputing or without resisting. That's the idea. 
You see, we place our control. In fact, one of the great illustrations of uh, the first century classical writers was to include the training of horses. You might have this powerful uh, horse that uh, 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 needs to be, we would say, break the horse. We really don't break the spirit of the horse, but we we train the horse to put that power that he possesses in that beast, and he has great muscles, uh, great strength, but he is willing to put it under our control so that maybe even a little child can take the reins and uh, move it to the right, and that horse will go to the right. Now, is that horse stronger than uh, that child? Yes. That's, it's not about who's the stronger in this particular case. It's who is willing to uh, be under control, and that's the concept of meekness. A trained horse who listens to a trained dog or a trained animal, in, in fact, a trained child who listens to his parents uh, is a meek child. Uh, and uh, But a horse is a good illustration because the horse may be stronger than the rider, but he is willing to give his um, uh, power over to the rider. And so if the rider says, uh, whoa, or giddy up, or uh, whatever the commandment might be, then that horse is willing to uh, go or woe at the command of the rider. We've even seen uh, 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 illustrations of horses so trained that they would recognize the whistle of their owner and uh, or maybe even the voice. Now think about this in regards to what Jesus said in John chapter 10 when he said, my sheep, Sheep are a very meek. Now, they may also be a prey, but they are very weak. But they give the control unto the shepherd. Not because the shepherd is mean, but because the shepherd is a protector of the sheep. And so uh, it simply means that I am willing to give control over to God, knowing that he has my best interest at heart, knowing that uh, uh, whatever he tells me to do, however he tells me, we're talking about a thinking process, right? The human psyche, training the thinking process of man. And uh, so we are training ourselves to be under the control of God. That's really what the Beatitudes is all about. We're training ourselves. And so that's what meekness is. Now in the Old Testament, and I'm going to get more in depth into this in just a minute, we'll go to some particular uh, aspects of this. Uh, but in the Old Testament, the meek are those who are always relying upon God rather than their own strength to defend against injustices. That, that's the ideal. Submission is a good word uh, for that. Bridled uh, uh, is a, uh, another word that uh, Sister Woodall has mentioned here and is a good word. Uh, we are bridled by the gospel of Christ. And so remember, we talked about with regards to uh, Jesus being uh, the great physician. That's where we began this concept out of. And uh, him being the great physician, we must be willing to go to the pharmacy of, of the gospel in order to be healed. And that's really the idea of meekness. Well, that doctor doesn't know what he's talking about. Oh, that pharmacist, uh, I don't need that pharmacist. Uh, I don't need to go there. That's what we're talking about when we talk about uh, this idea of meekness. And uh, so uh, 
uh, the meekness uh, or the uh, the the uh, ugliness of uh, wicked people in this world. Uh, we realize that regardless of what goes on, we realize, do we not, that God is always in control. We realize that he will deliver us uh, even in the midst of the trials and tribulations of life. One of my, one of my, uh, I, you know, you hate to say favorite, but but maybe one of the um, uh, favorite passages of this subject <laughs> uh, is Second Peter chapter two and verse number nine. Now, in the concept or in the context, he he's constantly talking about uh, God spared not. Uh, God did not spare the angels that sinned. God did not spare uh, the old world. God did not spare uh, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. But I do want you to notice in all of this, verse number nine stands out, does it not? Verse number nine, he says uh, to us, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust under the day of judgment to be punished. And do you realize that the examples that he gave were all, and, and this is true in every situation, the same situation. The angels that sinned, he reserved for judgment. But in the same way, the angels that did not sin remained under his care and protection. What about the old world? Well, the old world died in the flood. Noah and his family, those eight souls, were saved, 1 Peter 3 and 21, by water. The same water that destroyed the world was the same water that gave Noah a new world. So the old world destroyed by new by water, the, old, the new world entered in because of the water. And uh, so God, in the same or by the same means, was able to deliver the godly and uh, to reserve the unjust. The same is true with Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, anyone could have escaped uh, the uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, but only Lot and his daughters were. Even his own wife did not. Even though she was outside, they were not to look back. And so as she looked back, she was turned into a pillar of salt. Uh, Lot was saved. His wife was not. Lot's daughters uh, were saved. Uh, the rest of Lot's family were not. You see, and so God knows how to say we have to trust. Noah had to trust uh, in order to build the ark. Lot had to trust in order to flee. The angels that were uh, not reserved unto uh, damnation, those angels had to trust God. You see, that's, that's how this works. And so today we have to learn to trust God, do it God's way no matter what. I, I don't care what modern philosophy says. I don't care what the church believes. I want to know what does the Bible say. You see, that ought to be our motto. Right, that we uh, we we do Bible things in Bible ways that we call Bible things uh, by Bible uh, Bible terms. We're we're going to do things by the Bible, you see. And so that is what meekness is all about. And so meekness uh, sometimes it is translated, and I, I I'll be honest with you, I'm not a fan of this translation in regards to gentleness. Although I know gentleness is a part of meekness, that is not the concept. Uh, it's not just being gentle. There were times in which uh, individuals were not gentle, that is seen by the opposition as gentle. Was, was Moses gentle as he closed the Red Sea upon Pharaoh's army. He was not gentle toward Pharaoh and his pursuing army. Uh, was he, uh, 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 but he was the meekest man on the face of the earth. 
You see, and was was Paul meek when he called out false teachers? Uh, when he uh, went to the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15 and dealt with those false teachers that were there, was he was he gentle? Would they say Paul was a gentle man? I'm not sure that they would say that, but he certainly was a meek man. Now, my point is gentle is a part of that aspect, but the ideal that Sister Woodall mentions again, and I think she is absolutely dead spot on here, is that we're talking about power under control. It's the control aspect that I think is the most important thing mentioned in this definition. And, and we see it. Uh, uh, Jesus is described, you remember, in Matthew chapter 11 and verse number 39, right? He is described as meek and lowly. And yet he drove on two separate occasions. He even made a whip and drove out the mud. Was that meekness? See, my suggestion to you is not just suggestion, uh, is that this is a demonstration of the meekness of Jesus. Jesus was under control at that particular time. And uh, so in Matthew chapter 11 and uh, verse number 29, you remember that he says, take my yoke upon uh, you and learn of me for I am meek. Uh, Brother McGinn, it's good to see you here today. He says, uh, I believe Jesus himself said it best in Matthew 10, 16. Uh, well, if Jesus said it best, and I think you're right, then let's look at 10 and 16. Notice what he says. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be you therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. It's exactly right. Uh, Jesus was a meek man as he drove out those money changers. He was a meek man uh, in Matthew chapter 23 when he called uh, the Pharisees and the scribes hypocrites. And he uh, went, he had a whole sermon on the hypocrites uh, that uh, surrounded, uh, that were a part of the religious elite. Uh, he identified that identifying sin is not a lack of meekness. Standing firm in your position is not a lack of meekness. Uh, and uh, Jesus uh, 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 even said, uh, notice here in Matthew chapter 21 and uh, verse number five, I want you to notice uh, what Jesus says concerning uh, the king that is coming. Now he is the king that is coming and he's quoting from Zechariah chapter 9 and verse number 9, one of the great messianic prophets. Notice he says, Tell ye the daughters of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon a donkey, and uh, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now Jesus came in that meek manner in uh, could he have come in on a stallion? Uh, certainly he could have. Could he come in as a conqueror? Certainly he could have. But he chose to follow the directive of God. See, that's what meekness is. When Jesus says, not my will, but thy will be done, he had the ability, did he not, to call 12 legions of angels? The Bible says he did but he chose to suffer even though he had the ability not to suffer. Now that makes the suffering uh, even more powerful because it was a uh, volunteer suffering. It, it wasn't forced upon him. It was chosen of him for that. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about uh, meekness. Uh, we're talking about uh, the individual choosing uh, 
to follow God's will no matter what the outcome may be. So think about 1 Peter chapter 3 and uh, verse number 4 concerning the woman whose husband possibly uh, a uh, uh, gone astray from the gospel, but whatever the case may be, notice, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, uh, even an ornament. Now notice here, there is an ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God, great peace. So a husband that goes astray, what does a wife do? He knows the truth. So he doesn't need argumentation that God exists. He doesn't need argumentation that the truth is the truth. He already knows that, but he's gone astray. Now, this text is not saying that she can't ever speak a word to him, but when she speaks the truth, she ought to live the truth. And those two are a powerful combination. And uh, uh, it says here that she doesn't win him over by her outward beauty. She wins him over by her inward beauty, which is what? meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God, a great, great price. Well, there are other passages that uh, uh, we could note. I want you to notice uh, with me in 1 Timothy chapter 6, and this goes back to the power under control. Whose control are we under? That ought to be an important question that we ask. Uh, some think that we ought to be under the power of anybody who opposes us, and that's not true. I am under the control of God. And so notice here, uh, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse number 11, he says, But thou, O man of God, flee these things, but follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. There's our word. Now notice this, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of a term. Meekness is not opposed to warfare. You catch that? A meek soldier is one who listens to his commander without balking. That is meekness in this case. So in uh, Second Peter, or Second Timothy, excuse me, and uh, uh, verse number 24, where it says that the servant of the Lord, and that's the gospel preacher there, he's still talking about that, that the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Listen, I am not going to uh, hit you in the face if you're teaching false doctrine. I'm not going to shoot you in the head for teaching false doctrine. I'm not going to take a sword and run you through for teaching false doctrine. But I am going to take the sword of the Spirit, and I'm going to slay the false teacher. Now, some would some would say, "Well, that's not really a." Uh, in uh, that's not really being uh, gentle unto all men. No, it is being gentle unto all men. That is as gentle as I can be. And so it is important that we understand the concept of meekness. What is meekness? Now, here's the question: Who? Who? In fact, let me just uh, let me just tie these two together. Second uh, Timothy chapter. Uh, 1 and verse number 7. Now, in 2.24, uh, uh, he says that we must not strive, but be gentle. But here he says, for God has not given us the spirit of fear. You see, the spirit of fear and being gentle are not the same thing. That's what, that's what I want to emphasize to us today. We have taken a uh, false narrative and we have believed it in the church so much so 
that it has destroyed our ability to deal with false teachers. And we must always deal with that which is erroneous. That's a, that, that, that is the uh, warfare that we are involved in. And so we are not uh, given over to the spirit of fear, but of power, power under control. Meekness is not giving up uh, the fight for the right. That's exactly correct. That's what we're talking about here. And uh, so according to the root word of meekness, let's just go to the root and see what it's talking about. Equilibrium. Put that word in your mind when you're thinking about uh, the idea of meekness. Equilibrium. The full and complete possession of all of the faculties of one's being, the inner mastery. And remember, we've been talking about this entire time, we have been talking about the concept of thinking properly, thinking the way God wants us to think. We've been talking about the human psyche, the inner man, right? And the very root of this word meekness means to uh, uh, have our equilibrium. In other words, we are balanced in this. That's the point. It's not just that I oppose evil, I support the truth. Now that's the balance. I oppose evil, I support the truth. I, 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 I oppose denominationalism, I support the church of Christ. Uh, I, I support, uh, or I'm opposed to uh, uh, evolution, I support creation. You, you cannot be, e be wishy-washy Wishy-washy, I think that's a good Oklahoma term, is it not? I see Brother Chris Hintz here. Meekness does not mean weakness. It can't mean weakness because we're involved in a battle. And how many times in the Bible does he say, be strong in the Lord, in the power of his mind? There's the concept of meekness, you see. So we've got to keep our equilibrium about us. In the same sense that I'm going to uh, destroy all the false philosophies that are out there in the world, i got to build up the church. There's the equilibrium, right? A full and complete possession of all of the faculties of my inner man. The whole heart, the whole mind, the whole soul is devoted to God. There are no, uh, there are no bits and pieces that I can leave out of this. It's much like the captain at the helm of a great ship in the midst of a storm who is in full control of the vessel. He's barking orders here and he's barking orders there and he's telling everyone what they must do in order to get this ship through uh, the great. He doesn't panic. Now, he's going to have to raise his voice. He's going to have to be strong in his. He can't be safe. In the midst of a storm, the captain doesn't say, okay, now, guys, let's get together and uh, try to figure this out. Uh, it might be a good idea, Joe, if you went over to uh, uh, the starboard side. Uh, Joe, now, you do know what the starboard side is, right? You need, uh, uh, Larry, you need, you need to go to... Uh, 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 to the helm and, and you need to deal with this. You know, it, don't y'all think that's a good idea? Listen, if he does that, the ship goes down. So the job that he has is to be under and to know what needs to be done. Now, my job, uh, listen, my job, if I am a meek person, when the captain barks out the order, Rick, do this. Why is that man always yelling at me? Why, 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 why didn't he appreciate that I know what I'm doing? Uh, why doesn't, you know, like whiny, 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 whiny. That uh, whine, balking, uh, uh, being uh, disturbed by, when Jesus says, I want you to marry one woman or one spouse, it's one man, one woman for one lifetime, and there's only one exception to that. And that's what I that's what I want. If you marry, that's what I want. 
And everybody, well, I, I, I just don't know if that's a good idea. I don't know if that's the best way. I, I, listen, I, I, I realize I messed up the first time, but don't I get a second chance? You know, and, and that's kind of the mentality that we take. We're always balking at the orders. Even while Jesus was saying that, my friends, in uh, uh, Matthew chapter 19, you realize that his disciples uh, uh, were saying, don't you know that you offended the Pharisees? Jesus said, well, I'm not really concerned about whether or not I offended the Pharisees or not. This is the word of God. We, we live in a pretty wimpy society, not a meek society. And so when Numbers, in Numbers chapter 12 and verse number three, listen, Moses took the helm of the ship of uh, Zion while it was in uh, the 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 uh, uh, the, the, the mist of the storm in, uh, 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 captivity and he steered it out. And he did so by saying, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And, uh, so when we talk about the meat, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about equilibrium. Uh, we're talking about, uh, the full and complete uh, uh, possession of all of the faculties of our inner man being devoted to the will of God. And uh, so let's look at this. I realize uh, if we're not careful, we'll just run out of time because we do need to consider what it means to inherit the earth, right? What, what does that phrase mean? Uh, I, I mean, there's a lot of people uh, who uh, don't understand what that uh, particular phrase means. And so uh, I want to call your attention to uh, Psalm 37 and uh, verse number 11. Psalm 37, you probably had a reference in your Bible uh, to this because Jesus is quoting from an Old Testament verse. And so in Psalm 37, notice with me verse number 11. It says, but the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Isn't that interesting? They shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Turn with me to James chapter 1 and uh, verse number 21. I want to try to give you some background uh, ideas in regards to what Jesus is talking about when he says inherit the earth. And we have to, we have to deal with some Bible principles because of people's misunderstanding of this. But in James 1 and 21, notice what he says here. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and the superfluity of naughtiness, right? And receive with, there's our word, meekness, the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. The word of God has absolutely no power as long as it is outside. That is not over us. The word of God has absolutely no power as long as it is superficial in the mind of man. It must be engrafted in order to save the soul. Engrafted means that it becomes a vital part of everything that we are. It is as strong for us as it was if it would be a root grown out of the heart itself. Now it's engrafted in uh, that. And uh, so we need to understand from this vantage point what it means to inherit the earth. So I want you to turn with me to Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah uh, mentions uh, in Isaiah chapter 11 in verse number nine, give you a little bit of time. Uh, we don't got too much time, but I want to give you a little bit of time. Uh, Isaiah uh, chapter 11, and by the way, this context is dealing with the branch that would grow out of Jesse. James 1, 21, engraft that word. Now here's a branch out of Jesse. The study of the branch is a beautiful study in the Old Testament, and we don't have time for that, but it's a good study. So Isaiah 11, verse number one, beginning, says, there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Now, by the way, just in case you haven't already figured this out right, that's Jesus. That's what we're talking about here. That's Jesus. Now, you go on down 
I don't have time for the whole context. Look at verse number 10. Uh, and in that day, there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. And uh, to it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. We've already had a hint of that in Isaiah chapter 2, uh, but I want you to notice here uh, what exactly we are talking about. Uh, so in Revelation chapter 22, as the New Testament is closing, the Bible's revelation, notice what is said there. I, Jesus, this is verse number 16, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am, well, you can't get any more clearer than that. I am the root and the offspring of David. But now somebody, well, he didn't say Jesse, he said David. Oh, you're right, he said David. The reason why he didn't is because Jesse is the father of David. Uh, he's not talking about David. He's talking about someone who would come for the loins of David. Uh, this is the problem that the Jews had on Pentecost, was it not? Did not Peter speak unto them and say that uh, David was a prophet and David was not talking about his own soul, uh, not seeing corruption because his tomb is right there? We can pull out his bones right there. So it says, therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with him an oath to him of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would rise up Christ to set on his throne, you see. And uh, so uh, now Isaiah chapter 11, we've marched all the way around it. I want you to back up to verse number 10. Uh, excuse me, ver chapter 11 to verse number nine. Notice what he says there. They shall not hurt nor destroy in my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now, I want you to pay attention. This is vitally important. What does it mean? The meek shall inherit the earth. What I am suggesting to you is that Jesus is uh, applying the principles of Psalm 37 and Isaiah 11 to suggest to us that when he told his disciples to go into all the world, when he told them to uh, wait there in Jerusalem until they be endued with high uh, power from on high, when the Holy Ghost shall come upon them, when he said, uh, at that point, I want you to... Uh, uh, go into Jerusalem and into Judea and into Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the world. I'm suggesting to you that the phrase, the meek shall inherit the earth, means exactly what we are talking about here. The earth shall be filled with the knowledge and the glory of of God. That is absolutely essential that we understand this glorious and grand principle, right? Think about Habakkuk chapter 2. Now, well, I wish we had time to cover this, the entire book, but in chapter 2, I want you to notice uh, verse number 20. Well, let's back up to verse number 14 first. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Same as Isaiah, Habakkuk saying the same thing. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. And so what we have here is an illustration that Jesus is saying in the Sermon on the Mount, the meek will listen to what I say, the meek are those that will do what I say, and I say to them, go into all the world. The destruction of Jerusalem was near. It was within the lifetime of many of the disciples. Uh, and the kingdom of the gospel, pay attention to this. This is good stuff. I wish I could say I thunk it up, but I didn't. This is all Bible. Listen to Matthew chapter 24. The gospel 
was going to be preached to the whole world before the destruction of Jerusalem, Matthew 24 and 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, then shall the end come. The end here is not the end of time. It is the end of the uh, uh, city of Jerusalem. It is the end of any kind of connection that the Jews had with God outside of Christ. That's what we're talking about here. By the way, just in case you say, well, that didn't happen. Let's turn over to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, the book of Colossians, it is said, was written somewhere in the early to mid-60s. Let's say it could be even the late 60s. That's still before AD 70. Now notice what is stated here in Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 23. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard and which was, notice past tense, was preached to every creature. Same phrase of uh, Mark chapter 16, is it not? Go and preach the gospel to every creature. So he says, which is under heaven. Now that's the whole world. The meek shall inherit the earth. I'm going to suggest to you, my friends, that the meek inherited the earth when the earth was full of the word of God. I'm not saying every man received the word of God. I'm not saying every man lived by the word of God. But what I'm saying here is that every man had the potential of doing just that. This is the same thing that God told Jeremiah when he commissioned him. And, oh, my friends, look at here. Our time, our time is up. In fact, you may have already been cut off if you're on the uh, TGR inside. My humble apologies. But I, I will say this. Uh, the meat that is here are those that listen to and submit to the will of God. The way we inherit the earth is by doing what the Lord of all the earth has said. My friends, uh, have a blessed day today. May your life be enriched by study of God's word.